This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome to the 41st episode of Seoul's 2022 Year of the Ecological Garden webinar series. Thank you for the, taking the time to be with us today. My name is Christine and I'm the Special Projects Lead with Seoul. I live in Ottawa, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. For today's presentation, I'm pleased to introduce Seoul's Executive Director, Sandora Alfred Purvis, who is also a Seoul accredited organic land care practitioner. Sandora's theme today is nurturing native plant communities in urban settings. Her presentation will be approximately 20 minutes and there'll be time for question and answer. As the host of today's session, I will moderate the questions, but if anyone joining us live for today's presentations has their own, feel free to put them in the chat or else following the presentation, you can unmute and ask your questions directly. Finally, I'd like to mention that this webinar series and much of Seoul's work is made possible by the generous and ongoing support of Gaia College, Canada's leading co college for professional development and diploma courses in organic land care. So with that, let's turn it over to you, Sandora. All right, thank you. And I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, is the slide up and showing? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. I would like to check because there's been cases where it hasn't been. Um, I'm just going to move something out of there. All right. So, welcome to Nurturing Native Plant Communities in Urban Spaces. Um, I'm also joining everybody from Ottawa today uh, from the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. Let me. There we go. Um, so I, just to give you a bit of background on what I do is I've been gardening for well over 30 years um, and I learned from the same books and using the same techniques that you'll find sort of widely recommended, maybe not widely recommended by salt, but right, widely recommended in general. Um, and I've worked in the horticultural industry for over two decades and have spent most of that as a professional landscape designer. Uh, a, few, a few years ago, sort of in search for what sustainability in my work and my life would really look like, um, I really started digging into things like supply chains, ecosystems, soil health, and plant communities to a much greater extent than is usually explored in the horticultural world. This led to me making some big changes in my day-to-day -day work, um, a facet of uh, which was making an active effort to source and grow locally native species and to get to know them a bit better in the garden. And as part of that process, I also learned some things about where the needs of a lot of plants and the current realities of urban growing conditions collide and require some adjustments on both sides for, for native plant communities to thrive in urban spaces. For example, what is now urban and rural Ottawa, where I live, was once primarily forest, shorelines, wetlands, and air, some areas of shallow soil that, that limited tree cover, allowing for some meadows or alvar type ecosystems. Um, but, and with nearly a meter of water falling from the sky each year in this region, sometimes it's snow, sometimes it's rain, but about a meter altogether. Um, the historical burn cycle in this area is actually quite limited, which averages around 500 years um, or more, rather than the 100-year average uh, burn cycle in the boreal forest, um, and the much higher burn frequency of the prairie ecosystems and also oak savannas common in a lot of areas west of here. But since colonization, uh, which altered the ecosystems through the attempted removal of the people who managed and protected those ecosystems and the cutting of the mature trees, along with ongoing disruption cycles of things like annual agriculture and the mowing of lawns, the range of meadow ecosystems, prairie, grassland, meadow, et cetera, have actually shifted quite far north and east from their historical range. Um, this migration of ecosystems is also being driven in by a change in global climates. And that's something you can see in the updated growing zone maps, which for Ottawa have shifted from zone 4A, so that's Canada Canadian zone, to zone 5B over the last several decades. Um, and that map is due for another update. I would not be surprised if we actually qualify as 6A now. 
Um, and the official municipal report on expected increase in the length of summer and the number of over 30 Celsius days, which for here that's heat warning conditions, um, for each year for this Ottawa puts us um, roughly in a zone seven or zone eight uh, growing conditions, summer growing conditions that within 30 years. Um, because we're expected to have um, over 40 days of plus 30 weather every summer by 2050. Um, and that's a degree of heat stress that not all historically native species are going to be able to tolerate or survive. There have been a lot of changes and there's more changes to come. Not only are the forests that exist around Ottawa today early to mid succession rather than mature ecosystems, um, the ecosystem types that are most often found in urban spaces are closer to what will be found in open woodland, dry meadows at the base of cliffs and in the spaces uh, we direct the rain to um, that can't soak into all this ground that we've covered by buildings um, and paving. You get these sort of novel ecosystems that have aspects of both wetland because they're occasionally very wet and then very dry meadow conditions because in between rains they might dry out a great deal because the local system doesn't have a lot of capacity to hold onto water. Um, it just sort of puddles and then goes away. In many spaces, soil is compacted and it's also lacking that protective layer of coarse mixed decomposing organic matter. That sort of duff that you'll find in forest or in the meadow. Uh, if you go past the grassy layer in the meadow and the green layer, that, that brown layer underneath, that is a protective layer that, has that most species have co-evolved with the existence of that. Um, and that's missing in a lot of cases. But on the other hand, garden beds are often heavily enriched with organic matter like bulk, uh, bark mulch from forestry, um, manures from agriculture, or black earth from peat bogs. Most of the carbon that comes out of peat bogs is actually coming, or most it, it coming out in the form of black earth rather than the peat on top. So it's the bulk garden soils actually is where we're actually drawing most material from peat bogs. Um, all of that that we add to the gardens does create a concentration of organic matter within the, that soil layer that's actually far beyond what would be typical of growing conditions for a lot of native perennial species. Also earthworms, which were introduced from European ecosystems at the same time as European agricultural pro practices were introduced here, have increased the rate of cycling of organic matter and reducing the dust layer in forests. And that stresses many of the ephemeral and understory species and seedlings and have created the types of disruption cycles where other species like garlic mustard have uh, been able to thrive. And a lot of the harms we associate with things like garlic mustard are actually harms caused by um, the worms uh, themselves as opposed to the, the invasive garlic mustard. So all of these changes and differences mean that there's a bit more to cultivating healthy native plant communities than just reintroducing species that have been displaced. It also means that simply incorporating native species into existing gardens and gardening practices, that's not always successful either. The plants do not um, behave in the same ways in these systems as they do in their um, in the ecosystem conditions they evolved in. And so they can have some unexpected behavior and are not always healthy. Um, so in shifts away from sort of that predominantly Eurasian plant species and cultivars that currently make up the bulk of the garden and landscape um, in the most urban spaces, um, and also what you can find in most nurseries and garden centers, there are shifts that we also have to make in the preparation of gardens and the care of the plant communities. We need different skills to match the, the different plants. Um, We've learned to garden mostly with those and in, in, within those enriched soils with those cultivars of species from other places. Working with the plants from here isn't just a matter of a one for one exchange. There, there's a shift in our practices as well that needs to happen for those, those plant communities to thrive in our urban spaces. Um, 
And while making these changes is sometimes framed as sort of a shocking change that gardeners or communities just aren't ready for um, because of the momentum of uh, the conventions around what garden maintenance looks like, to me, it actually doesn't seem like a very different from the transition from the predominantly annual gardens and home landscapes to the predominantly perennial landscapes that we see today. When I was a child interested in gardening, I started young, local nurseries didn't stock much more than peonies and irises, and bearded irises specifically, when it came to perennials. And there was only two or three colors of each of those. They often didn't even have a cultivar name, they just had color. Now there's hundreds of varieties of perennials available at nurseries every spring, even in those seasonal pop-up nurseries. The single sad rack of native species at most Loblaws locations last spring, um, and last couple of springs, uh, was quite reminiscent of the single rack of perennials at a Canadian Tire Garden Centre that 35 years ago where I bought my very first columbine. It feels like things are at a similar spot. Um, and we made that ship, we can make this one. Um, but a lot of gardening guidance is still rooted in annual or otherwise edible plant care standards that are intended to maximize the rate of growth. Um, and practices, these practices do make sense for annuals, which have an ecological role of germinating after disturbance, capturing the resources released by the decay of disrupted perennial species, um, and then quickly developing as many seeds. Um, often contained within tasty fruits, which is why we like to grow a lot of these plants, as possible. Um, for a plot of earth to support that type of annual life cycle, the associated harvest and, and, and the associated harvest on an ongoing basis, enrichments, inputs are needed, things like compost, manures, etc., which create a very high organic, mat organic matter content soil that many annual species thrive in. Um, that's the garden soil that most of us are now familiar with and we think of as good garden soil. It's, it's associated with the needs of annual species, especially ones that are highly fertile and grow a lot of um, big fruits and well, the vegetables we eat. Um, another common garden practice that has its roots in growing food is tidying. In spaces where a narrow range of fairly tasty species are grown over a few or several years, um, the non-human life that likes to eat those plant species will be drawn to that space. And since they have plenty to eat, we'll have lots of babies or eggs or spores, etc. To interrupt their life cycles, the practice of removing or burning the plant material from the garden at the end of the growing season became pretty common. Um, the tidy and well prepared for planting season vegetable garden set the aesthetic expectation for what good garden maintenance looks like. And when gardens were limited plots of humid managed spaces in a network of complex perennial ecosystems, that all made sense and it worked pretty well, especially when combined with shifts in planting areas over varying periods of time. So when soil and ecosystems were allowed to return to their complex perennial state and the annual plantings shifted to a new site for the cycle of disruption, annual growth and slow transition back to perennial species are repeated. When you can have cyclical movement and when we're, where we grow, it has a different effect on ecosystems. And but that's not how land ecosystems and food systems are allowed to cycle on large scales these days in this place. Um, by this place, I mean most of the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> um, so our gardens are having, our, our gardens are having to take this on the role that the un, uh, untended spaces used to fill. They need to provide the food and the habitat for the species that do rely on complex perennial ecosystems because most of the pro complex perennial ecosystems that they used to live in aren't there anymore. They're agricultural areas, they are log forestry, and they are, or they are urban and suburban spaces. But in these urban and suburban spaces, we can bring those perennials back. So how do we grow complex native perennial ecosystems? Um, some changes are pretty straightforward. 
leave the leaves and the stems. I know the leave the leaves is catchy, but it's also and the stems. Um, I do my garden cleanup in the fall is basically just cutting back the stems um, that will fall over pathways and driveway or or towards the street over the uh, over the over the you know fall winter early spring, and I don't even remove them. I just cut them and usually chop them into a few chunks and toss them right back in the garden. Um, but that, and I clean leaves off of my driveway and my front walk, that, that's my fall cleanup. Um, so leave the leaves and the stems, they are critical nesting habitat. Um, and it's not just the tree leaves, leave all the plant bits too. Not only is that good for the invertebrates, so all of those pollinators we're planting all these pollinator gardeners for. It's also really good for the overall soil biology. Um, that biology evolved to feed on what the plants provide and to consume all the bits and pieces that the plants are done with and keep that energy and the nutrients cycling within the local ecosystem. Without that food, the ecosystem health suffers and it becomes less diverse over time. So you want to keep the material in the garden around plants. Plant overlapping clusters of plants. So having several plants of the same species together makes nectar and pollen foraging more efficient for bees and for other pollinators. So it is important to plant in clusters, but those clusters don't need to be tiny sort of monocultures. They can flow into each other the way clusters of plants do in untended settings where they're allowed to be in community with each other. You will have even under like Canada goldenrod, they're like, ah, it overwhelmed everything. If you open it with a patch of Canada goldenrod, there's probably another species growing under it. I see um, there's a lot, uh, depending on the setting, it could be sedges, it could be strawberries, it could be lower grasses. There's even those really strong growers, there's still another layer of plants growing in there. And they'll often they will be early spring plants because plants overlap in season as well. They get this late in the spring while the goldenrod's growing up, the goldenrod trades them later in the year, and then that's when they have the plants. Um, you can grow plants together, even really pushy plants. And actually, I like to put a lot of, if I'm growing specific, particularly um, rambunctious and exuberant species, I will often just plant all the rambunctious exuberant species together and they all just get along and have a party. It's great. I don't have to worry about anybody being overrun because they're all happy to hang out with each other. Um, and also when you're planting, don't stop with the structure plants and the flowering plants, include the ground cover plants, the species that fill in below and between those more eye-catching species, things like those strawberries and the sedges and things. Um, Mulch, especially like uh, fresh wood chip mulch is fine for right after soil disturbance, um, but it is a bandage, it's a band-aid. It's not replacing the skin on the ecosystem. Um, I always like to say bare soil is not resting, it's dying. Um, soil is, does not thrive when exposed to light. Um, plant cover and roots are what keep soil well and thriving and becoming more, um, fertile rather than less. Also plant to the ecosystem conditions rather than fighting against them. Look to examples of similar ecosystems and the plants that thrive in them for inspiration. Um, and a few of the ecosystem types that I find it helpful to look to for inspiration for garden planting um, includes dry meadow, average to high moisture meadow, woodlands and forests. And I sort of break it up in that so you could have an idea of what to do. There's lots of little subsections and you can you can break it into more and more pieces. Um, but for those of you who are joining me here today from Ontario, because I, I know this is a broader audience, um, you can find uh, lists based on those ecosystems on my cultivatedart.com website under the plant library tab. And I will, I will mention that website again at the end. Um, but when you're working with hot, dry patches um, of yard where turf grass is never happy, I think we've all seen those spots. Uh, those are perfect spots for dry meadow ecosystems. If you're, and if your municipality permits planting on the boulevard, um, what is, I, and that, there's a whole book called this, so I'm not making, hell strip gardening, <laughs> this is really difficult spots. Um, dry meadow ecosystems, probably the ecosystem to look at for your inspiration. Um, 
And in addition to the plants you would find under the dry meadow ecosystem um, list on that plant library page on my site, you, I would also recommend checking out bloomingboulevards.org. They gave a talk um, about how to create something like the Blooming Boulevards activity earlier, um, earlier in this series, but their website also just has lots of practical information, including plant lists for planting on spots like boulevard settings, and they tend to be very much dry meadow ecosystem plants. Um, they have some really good advice um, for species of uh, which species will tolerate those conditions, including salt tolerance, um, which is a, a novel condition that we came up with. It's salt tolerance away from seaside settings, <laughs> these poor plants, the things they have to learn to deal with in our urban conditions. But in general, uh, dry meadow species, they thrive most often in full sun settings and they cohabitate very well with a lot of the, of the sort of mid to low height grasses. Um, and they often are somewhat shorter than met wet meadow species because they're adapted to that limited water resource that is part of what defines this ecosystem type. Oh, and they often also, um, because dry meadow ecosystems are often fairly low nutrient growing conditions. Um, I think I'm talking for a while. Uh, while they're, they're often low nutrient ecosystems because soil, um, the organic matter doesn't build up as fast without uh, all that extra moisture in the soil and the extra plant material that tends to grow because of that moisture. So they're often leaner soils. Um, so high moisture ecosystems uh, or high moisture meadows, uh, while they might not be something that immediately comes to mind for urban gardens. Um, a lot of the high moisture meadow adapted species really do well in high organic matter soil with the type of steady water supply urban gardeners are used to supplying. Um, and redirecting a downspout toward a garden bed can do an awful lot to mimic a wet meadow ecosystem, even if it's not a full blown um, rain garden. Just the rain that comes off a roof does do does does make your garden pretty moist in some spots. And uh, you can find a lot of lovely plants in wet meadow yeah, settings, um, including the, the Joe Pie weed that's shown here and um, the, like the pink swamp milkweed. There's all kinds of plants that thrive in these sort of higher moisture settings that mimic garden conditions uh, or garden conditions mimic, I should say. And wet meadow species will often will often though be quite a bit taller than dry meadow species, um, or just larger overall. And they tend because they're making the most of available resources while also making sure they aren't overwhelmed by equally thriving neighbors. Um, something else I tend to notice with the the wetter meadow ecosystems is sometimes they they tend to bloom a little bit later in the season because they've got some time to grow up, um, and the earlier blooming parts of the community will often be a little bit shorter and then the late blooming ones well if you've ever seen a really happy joe pie weed and it's like 10 12 feet tall you can see some of them really can grow quite large but a lot of them are more in that four to five foot uh, height range um, and you can certainly find shorter ones woodland ecosystem um in addition to that ubiquitous big lawn that's just waiting to become a dry meadow ecosystem, uh, woodland ecosystems uh, or woodland is an ecosystem that's really widely common in a lot of urban spaces. They tend to be a mix of sun and shade. They have some tree cover, some open areas, some shrubs, some herbaceous species. Um, and and also they'll have to you know, have some garden beds and some areas that might be ground cover or turf. Um, lots of edges and what I would call almost like a super microclimate uh, where conditions can vary in just a couple of steps, whether it's a uh, change in grade, change in light conditions. Um, we, we actually have a lot of um, a lot of these variations in urban settings. And I would say woodland ecosystem is probably the closest ecosystem to a lot of urban spaces where you would have some tree cover, some of that canopy, some plants need to be shade tolerant, some plants need to be heat and sun tolerant. Um, and so there is a woodland plants ecosystem list. Um, but not every plants for every space because conditions will vary. So um, 
do make point of taking a close look at the lighting requirements and the growing heights and sizes when you're picking out plants from woodland ecosystem lists because woodland ecosystems can be hugely variable um, from just under the tree to past the canopy. To <laughs> it's really variable, which is just a trait of that ecosystem type. And finally, forest ecosystems. Um, and the first rule of forest gardens is to leave the leaves. Um, plant species adapted to growing under mature tree canopies, they're reliant on the foliage that falls from the canopy for root cover, moisture management, nutrients, etc. Um, they're also fairly intolerant of soil compaction. So if you're starting with heavily compacted soils, which is common if the leaves have been removed for several years, um, because uncovered soil will compact even just from rainfall. You don't even have to be walking on it. The raindrops hitting it will cause soil compaction over time. Um, if you're starting from that condition, lay down a few inches of like, arborist wood chips and give the biology a couple of seasons to start to restore the soil structure. Um, if you haven't been preparing space in the fall, uh, steal some bags of leaves from your neighbors and lay down at least a couple of inches of them. And that's like once they pack down. So you're probably going to start with like six or seven inches um, before you put down the arborist wood chip layer. Um, and you can then like the following spring plant some of the more um, urban resilient species, but some of the really um, super forest adapted ephemerals that are really particular about their growing conditions, give it a couple of years before you add those ones in. Let the soil biology recover. And do keep in mind that trees are impressively water competitive, um, especially when growing in an area where their root spread is constricted, but they can't do that natural spread of like twice the canopy range that trees like prefer to do, um, but can't always in urban spaces. Um, so new plants under or near them will need regular watering until they're very well established. And that establishment process tends to be slower in deep shade because they're just not getting as much energy from the sunlight. So be patient and do expect to water for a few years as you're helping a woodland ecosystem recover. So putting it all together, while I firmly advocate for a shift away from pretty being how we value plant communities and towards an appreciation for how much they do to care for the complete ecosystem, they are perfectly capable of being both beautiful to the human eyes and the eyes and senses of all the other lives they co-evolved with. Start with the ecosystem type and the species appropriate for the space you're working with, then do some arranging to suit your own. Start with the match of the ecosystem, then what it looks like. Identify the structural plants, the ones that stand above the neighbors or otherwise have a really strong visual weight. Decide how you'd like to place them in the space with viewpoint sight lines and also shadow patterns in mind. Um, and also don't forget safety sight lines, especially where travel patterns of pedestrians and vehicles intersect. So shorter plants near where your driveway meets the street, for example. Um, Choose or identify the blooming species for each season, especially with a special attention on the start and the end of the growing season, since that's when nectar and pollen are often least available. Although despite all of those dandelion memes every spring, most spring food for pollen and nectar feeders comes from trees like maples and willows. So the spring is probably slightly less of concern for pollinators because the tree canopy is where they will be feeding uh, early in the spring. Um, but the fall plants, those asters and goldenrods, they really do the work in the fall. Um, but make sure you've got food and also blooms from spring and summer, for spring and summer and fall, and distribute clusters for each season throughout the space for, minute, for your aesthetic effect. Identify sort of matrix species, the ground covers and filler plants. In a meadow setting, those are often grasses, but in a wood setting, they could, woodland setting, they could be st grass, still be grasses, but also sedges or wide range of other leafy species, including ones we tend to think of as fast spreaders, as long as they're not tall enough to overwhelm seasonal species. Um, and in a forest, uh, those ground cover or the, those filler species may also be the ferns, the big leafed asters, etc. Um, and this process of, of choosing plants can go in any order you like. Um, whether you want to start with your, this is the ground cover I have to work with, these are the colors I like for the seasons, these are my tall points, or the other order. Um, 
start with young plants and place them close together and let them grow up together. So we don't, rather than buying sort of a big expensive pot of plant and then putting one and then going another three feet, putting another, start with the smallest you can get them and keep them alive. Um, start them from seed if you can, if you can handle uh, working with small seeds. Not everybody wants to, but if you can do that, very inexpensive to plant a really dense ecosystem very quickly. Um, place them fairly close together and let them grow up together. Let them be intertwined with each other. They'll anchor and support each other and their neighbors. This is how plants grow in, in community. Um, make adjustments like introducing succession species over time as the short-lived plants complete their life cycle and then the, and the slower growing species get settled um, and, and in, as the biology, the soil biology matures. Expand the ecosystem you're nurturing by gathering and sharing seed seeds with your neighbors and local seed exchanges and enjoy the company of all the species that will arrive in the oasis that you're helping to create. Oops, there we go. So for uh, more resources, if you go to acultivatedart.com and check the blog tab, the most recent one uh, has links that relate to what I just talked about, including things like the plant library. And there's also um, a plant list that I did on Facebook last year, with lots and lots of photos um, in blooming order. All right, I know I went on for a while there, so questions. Well, I will just uh, start to thank you, Sandora. Another <laughs> very um, informative, well-researched presentation. I love the photos too, those are beautiful. Um, I have a question, but I would love people to put questions in the chat. Um, we have about 15 minutes. My first question though for you is related to all of these different garden or sort of yeah, garden types. So the woodland versus the meadow. And I know in my garden, it's just because of sort of 10 years in my space here in Ottawa, I've planted at different times, like different years, I mean, and the plants have grown up and I know that they, they're sort of mixed up a little bit. It's not just the dry meadow. I'm, I know I have wet meadow in the dry meadow <laughs> and I think things are doing fairly well. But what are, what's your opinion about transplanting and, and the disturbance that might have to the soil beds and so, the soil infrastructure? When we are relearning, and, and this is where when I say, you know, as things change, adjust. Um, and also we often, when we start out, we were working with a certain set of conditions and then those conditions do change over time. Um, I am not one of the, oh, you can't disturb soil at all. So I know there's some people who are like, oh, no, no soil disturbance. I'm like, that's actually not. The raccoons and skunks do plenty of soil disturbance in my yard. Soil disturbance happens. Um, it's just not, a, it, don't, don't constantly till and invert your soil, but digging up a plant and moving it to, to a place that is more suited to that plant's needs and then putting a plant into a place, that's that's going to cause some soil disruption. You're going to have a little bit of breakdown of some of the soil structure right around where you were working. But overall, you're going to have a healthier space. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, sometimes I dig up and move, but I also, um, ecosystem progression happens, it's a thing. And that means that some plants that were thriving, especially fast growing ones or, or ones that sort of established quickly, but then might be that, that might actually fade away because the conditions changed. You can dig them up and move them or especially, and this is a great thing when you're growing native plants is a lot of them seed quite generously. You can gather some seeds, start some seedlings, plant those in the space that's now appropriate for them. And it's not the end of the world if, if some plants um, fade away as the ecosystem progression happens as well. So some of it, and I absolutely do both. I dig some up and move them. And, and there's a um, orange uh, butterfly weed that's gotten completely overwhelmed by some asters and some other plants in my yard. And there's this really dry spot near my front door. And I'm like, 
you are going to be so happy when I dig you up <laughs> and you're going to come up next spring in this hot dry spot where nothing else is thriving um so I'm going to move some things around but there's other plants where I'm like no you've had your sort of stage in the ecosystem progression I have lots I've gathered lots of seeds you've you've had really successful reproduction your babies are all over the city now it's okay if those ones fade away um because the ecosystem I'm working with has matured somewhat in the 10, 11 years now that I've been gardening in this place. Yeah, well, and you raised a point though that there are lifespans for plants that I wasn't really that aware of, but some, yeah, might be two years, but are there any plants that live sort of almost indefinitely because they are reproducing? Um, and like well, and replacing themselves? And, and there's replacing themselves. So there's ones that, the crown might naturally die and then offset develops and a crown dies and after, like offsets develop and crown is dying and that's where you'll get sort of that circle out uh, pattern which occurs in lots of different plants but I think it's most famous in Siberian irises if anybody's ever grown them and you end up with a ring of Siberian iris with a dead middle and eventually if you leave it long enough that middle starts to decompose and, and seeds will start to grow in there from other species and you'll actually sort of have it and they'll spread out enough and then eventually it'll break into chunks and then they will become their own circle and you'll you'll sort of see this movement over time even if you have no if, even if there's no intervention um but, and, and there'll be an ebb and flow in their health over that time. Um, so some, there are some plants that really stay put, things like um, Baptisia, which there is a native one, uh, it's yellow actually, I've, I've got seeds. <laughs> they, were, they were in the seed order this year. Um, so there are some species that really do stay put, don't move really far, live a very long life. Um, and I don't know if there is a natural decline for them or their lifespan is more dictated by any changes in the ecosystem, but they can be very long lived. And then, you know, at the other end of it, there's like the, um, the Rebecca Herta, the, the locally native black eyed Susan, that like sort of the dry conditions, they grow up so fast, they bloom so beautifully and they are two to three year plants in most cases. I've had the odd one that lives a bit longer, but you know, they have abundant seed setting they they grow up really fast. They they really put on a show, but they behave almost like biennials in most cases, um, and that's perfectly fine. And I even have plants that sort of have gone through cycles of dying away, and then there's a bit of space that opens up, and there's a whole sort of resurgence of them, and then they fade away again. So change that that fluctuating is is quite natural. But yeah, there are some that kind of go. I'm going to be really slow to establish, but once I'm here, my spot forever. <laughs> well, and how much um, consideration do you make sort of in, in urban spaces, which are, tend to be quite small, when you are thinking about the night, having nice sort of meadow species that are sort of sun um, loving and, and the idea of, of the urban canopy and tree cover? And, and thinking about if you put one tree up and it grows up, it might just shade everything. You don't have that chance to have as much diversity in your garden because you won't have the same light conditions everywhere. And that's a longer term consideration, but how do you think of those um, issues in a small space like that? So I suppose the thing around as much diversity is sort of a, a complex one because there's the diversity of the layer that's at the ground that we're looking at and we might be interacting with the most as people who stand on the ground. Um, there's actually a huge amount of life that happens within the canopy of a lot of a lot of trees. This is also why there's a big push to plant native trees because the life that's supported within the canopy of native species versus say a ginkgo <laughs> or a Norway maple, um, there's a real a real difference in the amount of uh, native biology they can support. Um, but when it comes to say sort of less diversity, um, woodland ecosystems tend to have a lot of diversity because you do have sort of mix of, you'll have the shade tolerant, the partial shade tolerant, the at the edge sun loving, and then our spaces are going to cycle in urban spaces. There's there's not going to be a lot of getting away from that. Now, by cycle, 
it might be 100, 120 years, <laughs> but it's unlikely that in most urban spaces we're ever going to get back to that 500 year tree canopy condition because there's just extra stressors. Um, so they are going to be more dynamic ecosystems because we as a species tend to be a disruptor species, which there's lots of in nature. We just take it to a whole <laughs> other level. Um, so the spaces are always going to be a bit disruptive and disrupted and, and they're always going to be sort of in a state of progression and change. And that's okay. You meadow ecosystems tend to have lots and lots of seeds. You can gather seeds as they're starting to fade, give them out to other people who have meadow ecosystems, and then you can start sort of bringing in the, um, the more woodland species. And that is another point where humans usually need to have some hands-on involvement because um, the, the ecosystems are too fractured right now to just naturally have the, the seeds or the plants be able to move with the changing, the slowly changing conditions. So yeah, we have a bit of picking up and carrying to do as well yeah. as bringing water where it's needed. Well, that's a very good point because, um, yeah, another major disruption is the turnover happens when, when home ownership changes and then massive changes can take place. And, and that's consideration for people gardening because you wonder if the, if the effort and, and what will happen, and it's a concern, actually. It's not even just a, you wonder, it's, it's, it's a cause for concern. That things might be removed after yeah <laughs> maybe yeah maybe something else. but that's the reality and that's what we're working in and I, I like your point and i take it that a lot of what you're promoting right now is the the seed and dispersal and bringing that to other communities um bringing like people communities and plant communities and making sure that the life continues that way it's a nice it's a nice point yeah. And does anybody else have a question? They can they can unmute at this point or um, put the question there, and we will Sandora will read it or I'll I'll read it out. Um, somebody and I think they may have meant and they sent it to me as a private one, but it's just a general question. I'm moving into a house with a yard that is mostly a very well manicured lawn. How do I start the process of changing lawn to plants? I'm assuming chemical products have been used on the lawn. So um, actually with the uh, cosmetic pesticide bans in Ontario, there's probably not been anything too um, persistent put into that lawn. I, you know, sometimes people break the rules, but um, in general, you're probably okay just starting a conversion over rather than worrying about removing. And actually, um, if you go to that at cultivatedart.com, the blog, you'll see in there, um, and I'm just going to pull it up so I give you the proper name of it, but there is actually uh, a link to a little video I did on actually preparing gardens um, because I am a big proponent of compost everything in place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is called ecological garden making and it shows the steps of doing the sheet mulching and, and, and uh, planting annuals for a season so that uh, you get the ecosystem going and then um, and you can grow some perennials in a nursery bed while you're waiting because they can be quite close together and you just have to really fully prepare solstice and then move them over in the fall and by after sort of one year you're going to have be able to really convert a place over and have it start to become a perennial ecosystem really quickly. Um, so yeah, you can you can do that. And so check out on that blog entry um, the ecological garden making tab. Scroll down a little bit on it uh, on that page, and you'll see there's actually a whole video with step by step instructions. Yeah, I think everybody knows this probably by now, but you have on a cultivated um, art uh, a ton of resources, and also your own putting together of materials, but also gathering it from other sources that. Um, have informed you or inspired you along the way. So it is a, a very good resource site. Uh, so is Souls. Um, and I would like to say that there's a whole library now of these ecological webinars. And uh, this was the 41st. So we have most of the, the previous ones from this past year on our website. So you can always go back and research it by topic. Uh, the year was divided into themes. So this, this theme this month uh, was on native plants. Um, we're moving into our last session for October next week. 
and that is going to be on winter sowing seeds. Uh, so that's next week's presentation on the 25th. And then in November, we're going to be talking a bit more broadly, less um, specific, but more about the, the access to, um, to gardening and horticulture. And so it's, it's about bylaws, it's about um, access for different communities, public space or green space. So um, I welcome everybody to join those sessions as well and to check them out on the website afterwards. Um, we are at the closing time right now. Sindora, do you have anything you'd like to say? To, to close off? Just that this will actually be going on to the Soul website. We recorded it today, um, so it'll go up in a couple of days, in the next day or two, and uh, I'll also include the blog link right in that too. So if, if you didn't quite catch it on this, you will be able to find it later. It'll go out in the email to everyone. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating today. We look forward to seeing you again and uh, continuing this really important conversation and informing us and becoming um, more conversed in this, this whole movement that we have going. And it's very inspiring when we have people like Sindora who um, have a wealth of knowledge to share. So thank you very much. Bye.